going to be talking about resilience. Thank you. We're going to be talking about resilience. What does that mean? That elusive word resilience. What does it mean to you guys? Anybody? Your ability to keep going. Ability to keep going. I like that. Let's get through the whole thing. So, coming up. Okay. So, bouncing back. Bouncing back <laughs> after a hard time. Yes. Outstanding. Outstanding. Um, so, just quickly. Just quickly, resilience. We're going to talk about what it means to be resilient. We're going to explore factors that verify resilience to yourself. That's the important part about being resilient, that you know you are. Identify the role that resilience plays in your life and learn strategies to build up your own personal resilience. Okay. And lastly, we're going to reserve a few minutes at the end to talk about the EAP. I see some familiar faces, so you've heard my EAP spiel already. That's okay. Multiple uh, repeats of that is just a reinforcement. EAP is a very important uh, benefit that you folks have as part of working as an employee at JJC, even the part time groups have. I'll reserve a few minutes of time at the end for questions as well. Um, these pre presentations have been flying by, and uh, and that's great because that means we've been talking. I like to use this opportunity to turn a lecture into a workshop. Because the important part is not me, the important part is not the slides, the important part is you, what you think, what you feel, and how you experience this. So, my name is Tim Jenkins. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. Please interrupt me. Counselors talk way too much anyway. Put a finger up, jump in there. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you feel. Let me know what's important to you. Uh, I'm going to also hand handouts to the folks that don't have them. I don't need to turn my back on you. Let's do that. Make sure everybody has a handout. Who didn't get one? Okay. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. There's a lot of information in this particular presentation and a ton of stuff in these handouts. Feel free to follow along. I may not reference them necessarily directly, but you can use these to make notes and get reference from. Uh, we've got a lot to go over in this particular presentation, and it's really important that we have a voice here. So, yeah. First comment in the chat, please. answering your question. Please. Um, resilience is about being tough and adaptable in the face of challenges, stress, or adversity. Uh, I love the adaptable. What do you mean by resilient? Yes, absolutely. There's a number of different factors, right? Doesn't give up, being tough, right? Takes action. That's what Signa thinks. Faces fears. This one's hard for me. Seeks solutions. Yes. Did somebody say problem solve? I think somebody said problem solve. Able to adapt. Can you adapt to things that you aren't familiar with? Can you stay positive in the face of difficult circumstances that feel like you're not going to be successful? Can you believe in yourself when sometimes the circumstances make you feel like, gosh, I've been failing a little bit, I've been not doing that well? Can you maintain that belief in yourself? Can you manage stress? Freud used to describe stress as the slings and arrows. And of course, those slings and arrows were pointed at his model of the super ego, ego, and id, piercing those things, causing problems for us. Excellent. Fall seven times, stand up eight. So when we talk about resiliency, an uh, underlying sense of perseverance, an underlying uh, will that we can enact will help us to be resilient. Who do you think, who comes to mind for you guys that is a resilient person? Anybody? Anybody? Again, this is, I like to turn this from a lecture into a workshop. Who reminds you of resiliency? My siblings. Your siblings. Wow. Wonderful thing to have resilience close to you. 
Anybody else? Who reminds you of resilience? Parents. Parents. Yes. And you know what? I think that's kind of built into the job description, right? If you don't feel resilient, rising to the occasion, to dealing with childhood challenges, dealing with things that are tough. Parents. You have another spouse. Spouse. Another uh, spouse. The husband's battled cancer and has had some other health problems, and so she finds them to be very resilient. It's an incredible thing to have somebody that you admire so much because they faced very difficult circumstances, very tough things. Yep. We have a lot of these, don't we? We're human. Minor stressors, other stressors, life-threatening stressors, very painful, very challenging. Yes. Oftentimes when I give this lecture, people will cite celebrities as resilient, certain persons that they perceive as resilient. This gentleman who was rock climbing that got his arm trapped. He extricated himself in a very dramatic way and rescued himself. And people think, oh my gosh, that person must be made of steel. They're superhuman. They're extraordinary. We oftentimes think of, think of people that are kind of like war heroes, people that have brave situations that most of us would shirk from. But I'm here to tell you that you can find a sense of resilience in yourself. What shapes our ability to become resilient? How much stress that we have? And does that intersect with our current ability to not be vulnerable to stress? And where do we really find our resilience? Let me ask you that. What are the strengths that you have inside that would help you find resilience? If I asked you to dig down deep, what's the thing inside of you? What's the quality that you have? Or maybe it's not a quality. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a value. What do you guys think? If you dig down inside, what do you think? Let me hear your thoughts, please. Positivity. 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 Having that outlook. No matter what the circumstances, you know, I kind of referenced in the last uh, hour giving somebody the benefit of the doubt as a method of positivity. I said somebody flies by you and cuts you off and that kind of thing. It's easy to become angry at them. Right? What would you do if it were you? And your first thought was, they must be in trouble. They must be in danger. They must be in a real hurry. That positive outcome. Something bad happens, and you think to yourself, that's just one thing. I have many other things. That's just one thing I won't have. That's just one instance. That's just one circumstance. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about underlying values, right? Just because one thing went wrong doesn't mean that the rest of the things are going wrong. And we can rely upon things, can't we? We can rely upon the positive memories of the things that we've done well. Um, being empathetic, um, mm -hmm. having a positive attitude, and being raised by a fierce Filipino mother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny we laugh, but don't we borrow? Don't we borrow things from people that we know that help inspire us? And we, we keep that close to us sometimes. You know, you mentioned positivity. You've probably known people who were positive. You admired them, their ability to hang on to that. Your little kid, mother. Goodness. Someone who doesn't get upset. Yeah, they might get angry. They might get earnest. They don't let that get them down. They don't let the problems in life stop their forward movement because they are going to get it done. They're going to accomplish it. It's something inside. Where does it come from? Did you learn it at home? 
Did she learn it at home? Sounds like she learned it at home. We can learn it other places. We can, we can uh, young folks can learn it in, in, on the sports team. We can learn it in activity. We can learn it in school. Where did you learn? Where could you have learned? Where would you like to learn? What do you guys think? Could we choose to do things now, today, tomorrow, going forward, that would increase our resiliency? What do you mean? What do you think? What could increase your resiliency right now? Ideas, thoughts? Determination. Determination? Mm -hmm. If you say it to yourself in your mind, inside of your head, does it affect your heart? Does it make you feel courageous? It can. It really can. This is the therapist tipping his hand, showing you what it is all about. Thoughts and feelings are tied together. Your mind and your thoughts are tied to your feelings. All emotions are created by thoughts. That's connected in the hemimodal association area where memories and feelings are attached to phonemes, bits of words. What's your word? Courage? What gets you going? What gets you strong? Who do you remember? What can you say to yourself? What do you think? Anybody got a mantra? Anybody got a personal phrase or a word that helps them stick to it in this? My word is extraordinary. Magnetism, extraordinary, and that is extraordinary. I love that. Extraordinary. My father in law once said to me, We were working on vehicle. He's a mechanic, and I'm trying to learn something from him, but I'm also trying to bond with him because my now wife, right, abided by what he said. And I was trying to impress him. And we were underneath of a car, and we were dirty. And I was trying to get something in, a big, long bolt, and I was trying to get it in through a brake caliper. And he said, bend it to your will. Bend it to your will. It was lost upon me at the time. And it echoed in my mind, bend it to your will. The next time I worked on a car and I had to undo the motor and put a jack underneath of it and move the motor so that I could get a bolt through it. And I thought to myself, how am I going to move this thing? This engine has got to be 500 pounds. And I just heard him kind of echo that in my mind, bend it to your will. What do you guys have? What resonates with you guys? Has anybody said anything to you? You had an experience? My dad always said, see both sides. See both sides? What a wonderful way of identifying things that aren't apparent to you right now. What a wonderful way also, I think, of thinking about what another person is thinking. Where are they coming from? The person who cut me off, what's going on in their life? Do they have an emergency? Do they have to go potty? <laughs> Please. Um, your mind is a powerful thing. You can talk yourself into or out of anything. And then the other is we can do hard things. Oh, sage wisdom. You can do hard things. And sage wisdom in that, yes, you can talk yourself into anything. But you can talk yourself out of it. And, and what's that voice inside of your head that's talking to you? What's that thing that says, ah, it's too heavy. It's too hard. I can't figure this out. Now, I'm certainly not about giving, giving the expert opinion, right? Especially when it comes to technology. I've got an expert right over there. Is it faster? Yes. Sometimes I need to learn stuff and learning it from an expert. Wait a minute. I've got a bunch of experts in the room. People learn from you guys all the time, right? You take care of things around here and people learn things. That's a natural order for you guys. We pass on knowledge. We share information. <clears throat> People learn. They come to understand. No matter what capacity you serve in, whether it's educator or staff or faculty, right? That's what you guys do. But you're human. And 
human beings have this wonderful inner voice that can talk themselves into anything or talk themselves out of anything. Okay, back up. Yep. The neurobiology of stress. Oh my goodness, our brains are so complex. Things happen without your approval all the time. <coughs> and that's the neurobiology of stress. The threat response is hardwired for survival. The parasympathetic nervous system is what runs our body all of the time. And that includes our responses to stress. It's a holdover from those times when we had to run from the saber tooth tiger or that kind of thing. We had to take care of ourselves and it still exists to this day. And the small things trigger that? Yes. yes. Threat. Threat is a psychological phenomenon as much as it is an in-person actual threat. We perceive things as threat and it causes what? Stress. What is stress to a human being? Adrenaline or some stress. All right, somebody tells you you've got to stand up in front of a group of really, really smart people and talk to them about their stress. That'll bring some stress. Why? Why? I, we're, we're the tribe together. This is me. I spent nine years in education. They had to drag me away from it. Why is this threatening to me? Well, my brain kind of goes, oh my gosh. Am I not impressed with they might be smart. All kinds of stuff. And all of that, who cares? Who really cares? So our brains do funny things to us. What does your brain do to you? What does your brain do to trick you out of doing stuff? Anybody want to add? Please. Think about the things that could go wrong. Oh, yes. All of the things that could go wrong. Well, that, and that, and that. <clears throat> right? And by the time you get three or four of them, your brain has run away <clears throat> with you. It's gone, right? It's going, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm gone. I'm leaving. Negativity bias overestimates danger. All of the things that could go wrong. There's a wonderful study at the University of Iowa when I was a graduate student there. It was never published. Back in the day, they could do this kind of thing. They tricked a bunch of people into wearing what they told was a halter monitor. Really kind of cool. They put stickers on people's chests and said, wear this thing, right? And we'll pay you 50 bucks. And it didn't measure anything about their heart. We recorded their conversations. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, not okay. Not okay. Not this day. But in the 80s, things like that went down all the time, right? So they brought people in and they did a debriefing and they said, here's the deal. This was a sham, right? We recorded your conversations and here's what we want to do. We haven't listened to any of them. We'd like to transcribe the conversations and we'd like to then interview you and find out. If the stuff that you said was, if the stuff that you worry about actually went wrong. And for the people who said yes, they paid them 50 bucks more. They transcribed all of the stuff and they brought people in. And just about 90% of the things that people worry about didn't actually go wrong. Didn't actually go wrong. Don Roberts, amazing psychologist, that at that time was a graduate student and could get away with things like that. But yes, people got paid 100 bucks. And 90% of the things that they worry about can actually go wrong. Wow. That means our brain has a negativity bias. We assume that things are going to go wrong. Wow. Neural connections lock memory to fear. We remember things that are salient. We remember things that are outliers. What did you have for lunch last Tuesday? I don't know. Was it positive? Was it a good experience? Yeah, he was. It's a pretty good experience for me. I like eating a lot. I remember. I remember what I had yesterday. It's not salient. It's not an outlier. Do I remember the last time I almost got to a car wreck? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why? Right there. Right there. We remember the things that are threats. What do we want to do with that? What will develop resilience for you? when it comes to not stressing yourself out about those things. Please. Laws of attraction, uh, positive thoughts, peace, love, and positive positivity. Excellent. And then another, what you think about, you bring about. <sighs> I like that. What you think about, you bring about. Thank you for sharing that sage advice with us. What you think about, you bring about. Yes. Will you? Will you cause yourself stress and less resilience if you think about it? 
And can you decide not to think about something that's troubling? Can you set it aside? Can you think about something else? Can you say something inside of your mind or even out loud that will help decrease the stress of that? What might I say in response to remembering when I almost got into a car wreck? What might I say? I know it was scary. So I know it was scary, but I didn't. I, I, I looked down the road, and I saw a thing, and I had to stop really quick, and I squealed my tires, and that was scary. But you know what I didn't do? I didn't panic. Oh, I didn't panic. <laughs> I, I felt like I did, but I didn't panic. No, I steered, I braked. What am I doing? Giving myself those kudos, right? Those positivities that that person mentioned. One way of being resilient is to remember all of the good stuff that you do. Why? Because our brains are going to remember all the negative stuff that happened in your life. But do you remember what you had for lunch yesterday? Our brains don't do that, do they? Our brains lock in these memories. But you can practice. You can practice. The rational brain is part of conversation. That's what I want you to do. I want you to practice talking to yourself. <laughs> There's a joke behind that somewhere. I mean, psychiatry after all. Right? Rational brain is part of conversation. I want you to say, Tim, you know what? You're a careful driver. That you almost got into a wreck means that you're careful and you didn't because you're careful. Repetition reinforces positive feedback. You ever, uh, who's, who's seen Stuart Smalley standing in front of the mirror say, you're good enough, you're smart, smart enough, enough, and gosh darn it, people like you? Right. He's doing that. It's funny because it's insincere. Right? I want you to be sincere about this. I want you to be truthful with yourself about this and go, brain, I've had about enough from you. Right? Settle down, calm down. The truth is, Tim Jenkins is a careful driver. And on that day, it was very foggy, and it was difficult to see. I couldn't see around a curve, right? It was very slick out, right? The truth is that I'm a careful driver. That's what I want you to do. I want you to practice, but I want you to practice saying the truth to yourself. Then it won't be funny. It'll be genuine. Right? Gradually becomes the preferred response. Every time I think of something like a car accident, and I think to myself, oh, my car accident, my almost car accident, my response is going to be, wait a minute. I didn't have a car accident. I was careful. I'm a careful driver. It's going to become automatic. When we say things to ourselves over and over again, when we say them out loud over and over again, it becomes an automated response. She's quoting her adult children saying, they say, lock it in. Lock it in. Put it in there. Keep it in there. Write it down. Put it on a post-it note. Stick it somewhere important. Remember it. Say it. Look at it. Say it in your mind. Say it out loud. Absolutely. Lock it in. So the rational brain is part of conversation. We talked about that. It reinforces the positive feedback loop. We talked about that. Preferred response. The more we repeat a behavior, the more it becomes the preferred response. Build connections with small steps. If Tiger Woods didn't golf for a year, would he be able to swing a golf club well? Yes. If Mario Andretti didn't drive a car for a year, would he be able to drive a car well? Yes. Why does that happen? It happens with thoughts as well. Right? If a renowned mathematician didn't do math for a year and sat in silence at a Buddhist retreat, and the next day picked up a math book, did a problem, would he be able to, would she be able to solve that problem? Yes. Why? Because our brains are very plastic and they create a myelin sheath around dendrites, it's a fancy word for saying insulation around our nerves, and it protects those nerves, that action, that thought, that learned behavior, whether it's physical or psychological, it protects it. So when we say building connections, we're talking about Permanence. We're talking about practicing something until you know it so well. How does this look like in real life? <laughs> Resilience may be signaled in small ways. 
If we lock it in, it's going to be there for us, right? How will that manifest in our behavior? You got a guy talking on the phone here? Okay. How would that manifest in your life? If you could, if you could do one thing for yourself that would make you stronger, tougher, give you more stick to itiveness, you could lock in a thought. How would that manifest in your life? I know how I would do it. I would focus better. I would focus better. I would spend less time with my Samsung Galaxy Taskmaster and more time focusing on reading. I would learn some things. I would walk my dog. Those are some suggestions I really like. But I forget to do those things. Behavior reinforces those things. How would you guys do it? And what would it look like for you? What would it improve for you? Let me hear your voice. What do you guys think? What would you do if you could do anything and you knew? I'm going to quote a book here. Anybody know this book? If you could do anything and you knew you would not fail, what would that be? Extra points for you, you know that book, right? If you could do anything and you knew you could not fail, what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? There's a little bit of content validity in there, right? There's a little bit of content validity in there. Because in the greater picture, if we zoom the lens out, would you do an activity that you knew you could not fail that would reward you? That would reward you. Again, okay. it would reward you. If you could do something and you knew you would not fail, what would the reward be? And it's easy to say money, right? But the reward would be less stress. The reward would be no worries. The reward would be I get to buy things for my granddaughter. Here is four cake pops and her mother going, uh uh, no, no. Right? And she loves cake pops. What would you guys do? What would you guys do? What do you think? What would you do? You knew you couldn't fail. Would you build a house? Would you move to paradise? Confirmation. Confirmation? Can you, can you play a little more? Who's the most difficult opponent in the world? Someone else or yourself? Yeah. 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 How hard is that? I mean, so hard that we've become used to not saying what would be our success. Gambling is number two. In the, in the chat, someone mentioned the feeling of accomplishment. The feeling of accomplishment. Is that pride or is that something else, you guys? What's the feeling of accomplishment? I think there's some pride, but I think you can still feel confident you're not prideful. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something else other than pride, right? Because prideful isn't necessarily a real good value to land on, right? I'm prideful. I'm so proud of myself. I mean, you can be proud of yourself for five minutes, but if that's all it is, it's kind of thin, isn't it? It's a deeper thin. Self-esteem. 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 What happens when you're successful at something? It goes beyond just being successful at something. I'm really good at luge. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I've just heard it on the TV. Right? But if I'm really good at something, and I go, I'm really good at something. It feels good inside, doesn't it? It feels confident. It doesn't matter what it's in. 
I'm really good at getting my water maintained. It's great. It's healthy. It's important. It's nice to be good at something. And I would encourage you guys to look at resilience from that perspective as well. What could you do? What could you do to build your resilience? To build your confidence? Perspective is everything. Right? Because if you perceive it, is it more important than if others perceive it? If others perceive you as being successful at something, that's great and kind of famous. But what if you don't believe it? What if it's, if, what if it's not yours? What if it just happened? You, know, you didn't work at it, it's just, it just happened. What if your perspective is that you accomplished it? Maybe you're not famous because of it. You know, poets go through this. Famous poets publish contemporary poetry. And on the circuit, on the reading circuit, on the educational circuit, they're reading at all the universities. People are asking for signatures because people are studying it. But they're sitting at Barnes and Noble with a stack of their books, and they're really not famous. Their perspective is what counts. Work, the validity, what's inside. Can you think of other ideas where perspective is important? Purpose. In the chat, you guys, someone mentioned that I'm not perfect, nor I am I meant to be. Learn to forgive yourself for being human. Another, remember the cookie jar filled with all the hard things you made it through by made through a model, and you will make it through this too, David told you. He's quite a guy, David Goggins. Yeah. Yeah, he's the person that says, make it harder, please. Right? Because he looks at himself and he says, if it's not hard enough, I don't want it. He's attracted to overcoming. Now, I mean, I might not make it harder on purpose because I want success, you know. And my purpose may not be pure in overcoming. My purpose might be I want to be successful at that or at that or at that. But isn't there a isn't there a intrinsic strength that comes from knowing you can overcome things? I mean, we might call it self-esteem, we might call it confidence. But what is it there inside of you? What is it there? What is it there inside of you that you can rely on day in and day out when it's hard? I have an internal fortitude. I know when it's tough, I'm not going to give up. Maybe not hundred percent to everything you think you are, but you still rise up pretty good. I like that positivity. That's positive outlook, right? <clears throat> Since I've made it through already with these things, I probably will make it through this too. What about this one right over here? These people? David Goggins is somebody that we might admire. And through admiration, I mentioned uh, my, my father-in-law saying, bend it to your will, right? Through my admiration, it makes me stronger. If he can do it, I know I can do it. If David Goggins can do it, I know I could do about 10% of that. Who do you guys admire? Who gives you that strength? Anybody? And then chat, she mentioned, she can hear her mom always telling her, this too shall pass. I've heard that saying before, but I haven't heard it from her mom. And I bet it carries a special meaning from her mom. Anybody got any of those simple, straightforward sayings that have special meaning coming from a person? Or Everything, happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. It sounds like that came from somebody important. And you can remember that. 
when troubling times happen. You can rely upon those echoes of sounds, your memories of people saying those things. Everything happens for a reason. Shift in perspective. What can you do? Let go of shame, blame, self-pity. Is that part of that positive outlook that you mentioned? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Because if you spend a lot of time doing this, it's going to take away from your time of doing that. That self-confidence. And what is confidence? What is self-confidence? It's a feeling. And where do feelings come from? And right at my hand. All feelings come from thoughts. Right over here in the central surface. And parietal over the brain. That little spot for 99.8% of people is where we attach feelings to those words. And that's how feelings get enacted in the human being. And they get filtered through those glasses that we call memory. Because if uh, it's something benign, cactus. But your memory of a cactus is the time that you fell into a cactus. Right? It's going to be a different experience for you than it will be for someone who has it. Absolutely. We had a couple more on Please, here. please. The glass, is, the glass is half full and then extra grace required. <laughs> I like that. I, I like both of you. The glass is half full. That's one of those simple sayings. Because you know, everything happens for a reason. <coughs> sayings that we've heard. I don't know, maybe we could call them like parent sayings or something like that. Yeah, but they have special meaning coming from a certain person who inspires us. Or special meaning because of an event that happens. Mm -hmm. Pull out focus to see the big picture. This is where our values come into play. This one bad thing that has happened. There's a number of good things that we're not paying attention to. When they say pull out focus, we start to see all the good things in life, all of the important things, all of the things we've cultivated, all of the confidence that we've cultivated, the skills that we've cultivated. Because what do our brains do when something is salient and important and dramatic? Our brains focus on that and that alone. Oh my God, I had a, almost had a car wreck. I'm panicking and my heart is racing and adrenaline is pumping through my body. And I'm forgetting for a moment that I'm doing this for a purpose, a greater purpose. Attitude of gratitude, thanking our lucky stars. All of the things that we still have, taking stock of everything that's great, because this too shall pass, right? Everything happens for a reason. So say, remind yourself of capabilities. Right? What are you good at? One thing that I'm good at is I know I'm a terrible driver. Right? Reminding myself of that in the moment was a difficult thing to do. So you have to remember acting. I want you to be walking around, kind of going, good person. Very nice. Very friendly. I like to talk with people. I love dogs. Dogs love me. Children love me too. Mm -hmm. I'm temperate. I'm calm. I want you to tell the truth about yourself. And sometimes to admit, I'm impatient sometimes. Standing in a line, right, waiting for my stuff. What was that? Give yourself a grace? Because sometimes we need to realize that we're not that great at things and we need to cultivate some of this. Gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. I'm about to receive a wonderful meal. I'm waiting and learning for that because everybody needs a turn. And I'll take my time when I'm there. I'll get everything that I need. Right? I won't hurry. So a shift in perspective can help you face yours, adapt, and take action. You can lock it in, like she said. What do you got to do? Well, I know who I am, and I'm not perfect. I can embrace who I am. With all my flaws, with my impatience, you know, that's the grace I'm talking about. That might be the exercise. Can't get any place without breaking a sweat, right? 
kind of breaking a sweat standing in line with somebody asking 15 questions about food at McDonald's when the menu hasn't changed in years. <laughs> hmm. 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 That's me testing myself. For some of you, that might be God testing you. That might be uh, your ancestors testing you. Figure that out. Embrace who you are and figure out why it's hard. What is it that this is going to give you because you've overcome it? What skill? Patience is in short supply these days. You know, that flashing television, that uh, Galaxy, Samsung, iPhone, Taskmaster, all of those things have led us to have very little patience these days. Look for meaning. Is that challenge going to give you some sense of patience? It's going to stretch you out a little bit. Might be uncomfortable. Set goals, make them realistic. Small. Was it last hour that we said getting to the gym and doing one was enough? In the scheme of things, it's easy to say that's not enough. I didn't work out hard enough, but I did one. I did two, then I did five. Make them realistic, because why? 30 days from now, they'll give you three sets of 12. And you'll feel stronger, and you'll feel confident, and you'll feel happy. You also will feel sore, because you jumped into it really, really fast and hurt yourself. And then you avoid the gym. Use your moral compass as a guide. When I'm talking about moral compass, I'm not talking about should or should. But I'm talking about our core values of what you want for yourself, your family, your needs, why? If it's important to you to get out of line and not stand in that line because you've got a value that says the kids are never going to tolerate this, that's a, that's a moral value. And I'm going to step out of line and do something else because I figured out that for me it's better. I want you to discern, okay? Who can help you? Let's, uh, let's go around the room. Who can you rely upon? Who do you feel like you could ask for help from? Who wants to start? You're here. Let's put you to the test. I'll start. Okay. Who can um, you rely upon? Um, friends. 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 If you, and if you ask those friends, I need some help with this. You have some that say, yeah, but maybe you can How about? Spouse and parents. Spouse and parents. Spouse and parents. How about friends and spouse? Can you rely upon them? Siblings. Oh, I like that. How about who can you rely Sisters, husband, friend. How about who can you rely on? My wife and my in laws. Wife and in laws. In laws. Wow. Go to the parents. 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 Go to the when we mention COVID, right, it's something we overlook sometimes, isn't it? Some of the things we will rely upon each other in this room, we may not remember that as quickly as we do the other things. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Come on. Same thing, family, friends, and coworkers. And coworkers, you feel the same? I do. Come on. Friends. Friends. It's okay. Yep. You two also with co workers. Oh, yeah. These two are amazing. We're co workers right here. <laughs> yes. Yes. Kudos to you guys. It's a wonderful thing to be able to rely upon people. They have your back. Yes, they have your back. They have your back. You know, at a couple of different levels, I think. I'm going to just mention this and go out on the limb. I don't know you folks, but I'm thinking that 
you can rely upon them if you needed something from them. But the second level is knowing that you could. If you needed it, it gives you strength. I know that if I, the chips were down and I really needed this help, I know they would be there. What kind of strength is that? Right? What kind of energy does that give you? Helps you along a little bit, right? If I needed to, I could go along. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Wonderful. Anything to add? How about it? Family friends. Friends? Sir? Wait. Family. Family. Oh. Oh, um, so for myself, I would say my spouse, my mom, and some friends. Mm -hmm. Anybody from the chat? From the chat. Sometimes a helping hand is only at the end of your arm. Mm. 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 Oh, I want to circle back to that. Good Lord. Yes, that too. Okay. Any thoughts come to mind? Friends and co-workers. Friends and co-workers, yeah. Mom. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Excellent. Sometimes the best help comes from you. Is it easy to forget? Is it easy to forget that you're key? Is it easy to forget that you do? Yeah. 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 I told the story of my father-in-law helping with a problem that I was trying to fix a car and I get a bowl through something. It would go through. And he said, bend it to your will. That means you do. That means you do. Right? This whole car was put together by people who weren't smart than me. They were just capable. They knew how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I've got to figure out a way how to do it. Don't give up. Try hard. When you connect with other people and you know that they're there for you, that they're by your side, you know you can rely on them. Right? What's that feel good hormone that they're talking about? Oh, you know the actual word, oxytocin. Yes. Yeah. Adrenaline. Sometimes adrenaline is good. Oxytocin. That in blue and Kathleen, that's the energy part. You hear about somebody getting into a traffic accident or something like that, and you still have energy and you think you just go, well, how are you doing this? Right? Friendship. Our brain is a wonderful and funny thing. We don't necessarily understand all of it, but sometimes it gives us what we need. And when you remember these things, when I ask you to remember these things about being capable and taking care of yourself, and also being able to rely upon other people, and also the knowledge of other people, being in your corner, being in your court, right? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those few things. Use mindfulness to require a response. I said before, if you practice this, it will become your norm. Right? I love it. Know that the storm will pass. Right? Can you have a comment about that? All right, here's the foundation. Here's the stuff that's hard to get. Sleep resets the mind and the body. Uh, there's a famous quote uh, from a neurologist about what sleep is, and he said, the most that we know about sleep is that we're required to get it. We don't really understand. We discern some stages of sleep. Some people say four, some people say five. We know it's necessary to get. We don't exactly understand why is it resting. Yes, it's resting, except that our brains are more active during some stages of sleep than in awake state. So we don't really understand why. But sleep is really important. Freud said that sleep accesses the subconscious, and that is somehow a release valve of tension. Food can be a friend or foe. Use your food like it's a tool and like it's a gift. But yes, sometimes we need to use food like it has a pharmaceutical effect on us. Use it well. If you need it to recover, it's okay to eat carbohydrates. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's all right. It's not the devil. We all go through phases over time in the 80s. The chicken couldn't have skin on it. And that was bad. We all go through these kinds of things with society, but 
You make the decisions that are right for you. No one knows your body like you do. Exercise changes stress response. Even one repetition. What does it do for you? It defeats adenosine. It causes catecholamines to be lower. That includes adrenaline and norepinephrine. We talked about those. It increases cortisol. Doesn't affect your gut as much. Exercise is good. Do you have to be an Olympic swimmer in order to exercise? No. Can you take a nice walk outside with some sunshine hit your face? Walk with dogs? Can you take a stroll down the hall? Like that? yes, you can. That is all exercise. Yes, absolutely. Good. A couple of tools. All right. Here's where we talk about giving you the, the power to find this. This belongs to you. I'm going to challenge you to do this for yourself. And I'd like you to reference what we've talked about here, what you've talked about here. Okay. The EAP is here for you in a number of different ways, including helping you find your resilience. Of course, EAP includes counseling services. Those do not necessarily have to be because of a problem. They can be exploration. They can be support. Right? You don't need a diagnosis for EAP. You don't need a treatment plan for EAP. It's why counselors like me are attracted to doing it. We can have conversations with you about your decisions. It is confidential. We don't pay a thing for it. It is free for you. You may have five sessions, I believe. Six sessions. That's not six per year or six per month or six per week. That's six per issue. Cigna Evernorth is very uh, uh, very uh, giving when, when it comes to sessions. And they'll ask you questions when you call to get an authorization or when you text to get an authorization. And if there are two or three problems, they'll give six per problem. It is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we're talking about the unlimited telephone consultation. When you call, the person you fix up is a clinician. Okay. It's a household benefit. So you know, uh, Erin likes to step over the word family into the word household. Whomever you designate as part of your household can have access to this. It is also confidential and free. Work life support, such as elder care, child care, and pet care. I wish they paid for those. They don't. They will help you find them so that if you lose your child care, you can get it. Now, anybody can do a Google search, but you're left with 15 child care places that you have to call and find if they meet your special circumstances. They will do the work for you. It's almost like having your own personal concierge, right? Convenience services. What this means is that if you were to have your identity stolen, and they'll help you with that. Different aspects that are unusual circumstances that they'll help you with. Okay. Financial services. What they mean by this is you can speak with a certified financial advisor. Or you can speak with a CPA. Most likely people will speak with a CPA for taxation issues. And the first one for uh, retirement funds, things like that. Uh, legal services. Uh, this is being able to speak with an attorney. We will advise you over the phone. The only thing you can't speak with them about or that they're forbidden to speak with you about through this service is labor law. Uh, but I found this uh, uniquely helpful on a number of different occasions when I've had legal questions that I could not answer. Uh, they will also answer your legal questions. Okay. Questions, concerns, thoughts? I want to thank you all very, very much for all of your input. I really asked a lot of you today and you rose to the occasion. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, uh, the wisdom for you and the wisdom of your families. And thank you for everybody in the chat sharing all your sage uh, sayings and advices. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Can we thank give you. our presenter Tim? Um, again, for those who are needing the PGUs um, and to need to be able to scan here for our registration for our attendance for the evaluation. Today's color for session uh, finding your resilience, the key word is blue. So for those in the chat, I have put the link for you to be able to complete the evaluation and to your attendance. The key word is blue. I'll kind of come a little closer if you have your devices. If for some reason you are, I'm going to go ahead. Um, if you don't have a device, if you wouldn't mind waiting just to the end 
And I'll have this available on the table for you to come up and to be able to uh, do your registration. Thanks.